All right, this is our lecture video talking about the chordates and vertebrates. We're continuing our study of kingdom animalia. We looked at the invertebrates in our last lecture, and that's where we looked at things like phylum periphera, which included the sponges, echinodermata was the starfish, and so on. So those were all organisms that lacked an internal supporting structure, which we call our spine. So we're going to now progress up the evolutionary tree and look at the chordates and vertebrates. So the chordates, phylum chordata, is uh, made up of a number of organisms that have an internal supportive structure. So rather than an external um, skeleton made of chitin, as we saw in the crustaceans and the insects, we have an internal supporting rod called the notochord. We also have a nerve cord, which is uh, the early versions of a spinal cord. And we have pharyngeal pouches, which are areas where gas exchange can occur. And then we see the post-anal tail, so a, a tail extends beyond the anus, and that is something that is unique and new developments evolutionarily in the phylum chordata. So the chordates, um, again, we have those that do not contain vertebrae, vertebrae as in phylum vertebrata, so these include the lancelets, lancets, lancelets and sea squirts. So these are both ocean animals and they are similar to the invertebrates in that they have bilateral symmetry, but we know that these are a little more developed because of that notochord being present, which we did not see in the invertebrates. So the lancelets, here we can see they have the gill slits, they have the supportive notochord, and uh, the fin, which is uh, will become a tail eventually, but we can see that that's more evolutionarily developed compared to some of the invertebrates we looked at. Sea squirt is a little different, more of a unique creature as we look at this here, but again it has that gill slit that makes it fit into the chordates. So looking at the phylogenetic tree here, this is kind of a nice summary of what makes each group of organisms that much more advanced than the one before it. For example, uh, the notochord is what developed, and we see the tunicates and lancelets as representative of that uh, development. And then we look at the vertebrae, we see the jawless fishes enter into the picture. And then when we look at jaws, we see the cartilaginous fishes enter in, and so on and so on. So we're going to kind of just go through each of these groups and talk about the major characteristics of each group and what makes them more evolutionarily advanced than the one before it. So looking at the vertebrates then, the, they have a vertebral column, so actual vert, vertebrae to support the back, so the backbone. Uh, they have a skull, so when we talk about a high degree of cephalization, we're referring to just the development of a head. So um, the skull supports the brain and protects the brain, so that is a unique development of the vertebrates. And this endoskeleton, so not only the vertebral column, but also the rest of the skeleton that articulates with that those vertebrae. So that is for protection of internal organism, um, protection of internal organs. For example, the uh, ribs protect the heart and lungs, and the, uh, we already talked about the skull, protects the brain, uh, muscles attached to the bone and allows for movement, and we see paired appendages, which are arms and legs. So looking at some of the internal organs of this group, the vertebrates, they have a complete digestive tract, so there's a mouth ending with the anus. There's a closed circulatory system, which means there's blood vessels that the blood flows through. Um, there is a respiratory system of either gills or lungs, and there's kidneys to filter out the blood and get rid of waste and regulate water balance, so creating urine. So these are all unique uh, developments that we did not see in the invertebrate organisms. So when you look at some of the major uh, developments in this group, the jaws, the development of a movable jaw to allow organisms to prey on other organisms, that is a unique development of the vertebrates. 
the lungs and bony skeleton, we see those develop in the frog. Remember we looked at the lungs when we dissected our frogs. And the amniotic egg, so that allowed some of the vertebrates to uh, leave the water and live on land and reproduce because the organism, the developing organism, is found in that amniotic egg and does not require water. And we'll talk about uh, a little bit more about that. So without an amniotic egg, then the eggs have to be laid in water. So the amniotic egg allows for reproduction on the land. So looking at our first group uh, beyond the, the um, lancets and the sea squirts, we have the fishes. So there's two major groups of fishes. There's the jawless fishes. So they're called the agnathans. So the agnathans are the jawless fishes. They include the, the lampreys and the hag fishes. So they have a scale covered skin. Um, they are jawless, but they do have fins. So they don't have a bony skeleton as of yet. So they're not uh, quite as developed as the regular fishes, but um, they are more developed than those chordates we mentioned, like the lancets. Lancelets. So the lamprey is an example of an agnathan, and we see it, um, that it is predatory on other fishes. So lampreys are um, parasites, and they attach with this toothed oral disc, and they suck the blood of their host, and they can be deadly to fishes. So they're sometimes a, a real problem in some aquatic environments. Looking at the fishes with jaws, these are those that can have movable jaws, again, for prey. So they can ingest and they have some have teeth and they can, you know, prey on other organisms. So characteristics of the fishes with jaws would be ectothermy. And what ectothermy means is that the temperature inside the body is the same as the temperature outside. So if I look at a shark in a cold ocean, that shark body temperature is going to be the same temperature as that cold ocean water. So they aren't able to regulate an internal temperature. So we call that ectothermy. So thermy meaning temperature and ecto meaning outside. So the temperature of their body is the same as the temperature outside the body. They also have gills and the skeleton can be either made of cartilage or of bone. So there's two different groups of the fishes with jaws that we're going to talk about. And they also have scales, so that describes the outer surface of these organisms. So the cartilaginous fishes are called chondrichthys. So ichthys refers to the fishes. So when you see that suffix I-C-H-T-H-Y-E-S, ichthys is, refers to fishes. So chondra means cartilage. So these are the cartilage fishes, the cartilaginous fishes. So their skeleton is not bony but made of cartilage, so it's much more flexible. This includes sharks, rays, and skates. What is less advanced about this group of fishes is they don't have a fleshy um, operculum. An operculum is a fleshy cover over the gills. And these, the chondrichthys, the sharks and rays and skates, don't have a covering over the gills. You can see the gill slits that are um, just accessed straight to the outside, and we'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. They also have a lateral line system, and the lateral line system kind of acts like a nervous system and allows them to navigate in the water and sense the environment around them. So that's a, a nervous system development that allows them to move in the water and, and locate prey. Uh, they, uh, some are filter feeders and others are predators, so we know sharks definitely are powerful predators in the oceans. And rays and skates have really large pectoral fins that are almost wing-like, making them look like they're you know, flying through the water. So here is a classic uh, shark, and here's the gill slits. Again, there's nothing covering those gill slits, so those slits are exposed to the outside. And again, they have jaws, movable jaws. So this is chondrichthys, the, the sharks. And here's an example of a stingray. So it has these uh, pectoral fins that are elongated, um, making them kind of uniquely shaped. Um, the bony fishes now are called osteichthys. So ichthys again means fish, and oste refers to bone. So the prefix oste means bone. 
So these are uh, ray-finned fishes. When we look at their fins, they um, have uh, bony uh, extensions in them that you can kind of radiate out like a fan. Um, some of them are lobe-finned, which means their fins are a little more developed at the base. Instead of being a pure, flat, thin fin, they actually have a, almost like an arm-like structure, and I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. And a unique development of these fishes is the swim bladder. And the swim bladder allows them to bring air in and maintain their position in the water at different heights. So they can um, just kind of hang out in the water and, and not have to use their fins as much because of that uh, gas-filled sac that just holds uh, air and keeps them, well not air air, but air, well I guess it doesn't matter what is in it, the point is, is that it keeps them buoyant under the water. And maybe you have noticed as a fish is dying, what happens, the, the swim bladder empties and the fish, or maybe it fills more with, with gases as the fish dies and the fish turns upside down and is floating on the top of the tank or the top of the lake. So that swim bladder keeps it submerged in the water at different depths. And when a fish dies, it floats to the top. Or when it's dying, you might notice it's starting to tip to the side and it's not able to maintain its position anymore as it's dying. So that swim bladder really helps with maintaining buoyancy and being at different levels of the water. Fishes also have a well-developed brain and nervous system. They're very reactive. You know if you've ever gone fishing before that sometimes you need just the right bait to attract a certain species of fish because they are very discerning of their environment. They have a brain and eyes and they know what you know particular baits you know they are attracted to and um, sometimes if we overuse a bait those fish will no longer go after it so that's good fishermen will sometimes switch up their baits to keep the fish interested. So the, the bony fishes are much more advanced. And when you think of the bony fishes, you're thinking of those fishes that we have in our Wisconsin lakes, like the perch and the trout and the northerns and, and all those popular fishes that people go for. Um, the seahorse is another example of that. A stingray is another example of the, the bony fishes. So when you look at this, we have this operculum here, which is this fleshy cover over the gills. So that is something that is a unique development of the fishes, is that operculum. And the operculum is spelled O-P-E-R-C-U-L-U-M. Again, it's O-P-E-R-C-U-L-U-M. So the operculum covers the gills, and that's a unique development of the bony fishes that we saw did not see in the cartilaginous fishes like the shark. So the lobe fin fishes are a little bit more developed because those fish, those fins are not ray shaped, but actually they look a little bit like an arm or a leg. So here's the lobe fins. So you see it's more look like a fin out on the end here, but it almost looks like an arm here. And this is a more uh, developed advancement going up the evolutionary tree becoming more like an amphibian. So our next group of animals that are beyond the bony fishes that have a little more evolutionary advancement are going to be the amphibians. So the coelacanth, which is a lobe-finned fish, is in that category where we're moving away from the ray-finned fish here, osteichthys, and moving toward amphibians. So the amphibians, what's unique about them is they have true limbs. They have arms and they have legs. So they don't have fins anymore. They have true limbs. So most are tetrapods, which means they walk on all fours. So the, they have smooth, non-scaly skin, and their skin is moist. So they do require um, a moist environment. And another development, instead of gills, the amphibians have lungs. So we see that in the adult forms of the amphibians. Obviously, we don't see those in tadpoles, but we do see lungs in the developed frog. They have a double-loop circulatory system with a three-chambered heart. So we'll look at that in a little bit. Um, a three-chambered heart, they have two atria and one ventricle. So we'll, um, we looked at that in lab, if you recall, when you dissected your frog, that there was two atria and just one ventricle on the bottom. And then remember that ventricle was drained by the conus arteriosus, that large vessel that carries blood away from the heart. 
They have sense organs that are tuned in for life on land, so they are able to detect sound in the environment. They are like the fishes in that they do still have ectothermy, which means their, their body temperature is the same as the environment around them, so they are temperature sensitive. And they have aquatic reproduction, so when they lay their eggs, those eggs are not protected, protected, so they need a moist environment, so the eggs are laid into the water. And some of you saw when you were dissecting your frogs that the, some of the frogs had a, a large amount of eggs inside the abdominal, re, abdominal cavity, and that is um, you know, characteristic of aquatic reproduction there. There's nothing to protect those eggs, so they need a watery environment, and there's many, many eggs that are released you know, at one time because the chance of predation and being eaten, all those eggs as food, is really, really high. They also have metamorphosis, so when those eggs develop, they turn into tadpoles, which still require an aquatic environment, and then they slowly grow limbs and can move out of the water as adult frogs. So that change from um, one aquatic tadpole to a land-dwelling frog is pretty dramatic, so we call that those change in forms of development from tadpole to the frog, is, we call that metamorphosis. And we see that in the in the, the butterfly. We have caterpillar and then a chrysalis and then the actual butterfly. So this is just an example of how the circulatory, the cardiovascular system is changing as we move up the evolutionary tree. In the fishes, they have an atrium and ventricle that are separate here, but we have a single loop. Everything comes through um, just kind of in one single circuit here. In the frog, in the amphibians, we see this again, two atria, one ventricle, but we can see there's kind of a loop going up to the, the lungs, and then there's a loop that comes down to the rest of the body. So there's a double loop here, but only one ventricle. And then when we get into the more developed animals that have a uh, four-chambered heart, they have two atria, two ventricles, we can see we have a completely um, separate lungs from the systemic cap uh, arteries and capillaries and veins here. So we do see the double loop here and the double loop here, um, but an extra chamber, which is that um, the two ventricles. So looking at the amphibians, the most familiar ones are the frogs. Um, salamanders are also amphibians, and the Sicilian is another one that is an amphibian. They have um, characteristics, again, they have that smooth skin. Um, there is some gas exchange through the skin, but again, they do have lungs, and they require an aquatic environment for reproduction. So that's characteristic of the group of amphibians, but um, you know, just remember that they have that three-chambered heart, so they're not quite as developed as the next group we're going to look at. So when we look at the reptiles now, the reptiles have paired limbs, so they have arms and legs. They have much more efficient breathing with the environment. There's some gas exchange, like I said, in the amphibians that occurs through the skin, but in the reptiles, it's truly through the, through the lungs. So very efficient breathing through the lungs. Um, they have uh, the ventricle is starting to divide, so there is a wall that can separate them into two ventricles, two halves, so good circulation and we don't have that mixing of blood because if we go back here we can see with this one ventricle the purple is kind of where we see a mixing of blood where when we have a, a two chambered you know on the bottom the two ventricles we have complete separation of blood so we have purely oxygenated blood going to the tissues where here we have kind of a mixture of blood of old and new blood going to the tissues so this is a little more efficient to have a two chambered heart so moving back to the reptiles then, um, looking at just some basic anatomy here, um, we're not going to go much into internal anatomy of the organisms, we're mostly looking at evolutionary advancements. And remember a big thing is that amniotic egg. 
So the ability to reproduce outside the water is a huge advantage because that helps them move into new habitats and utilize new resources, resulting in less competition for food. So the amniotic egg has all the, the moisture and nutrients it needs until those um, baby reptiles hatch. So they are very much subject to predation because they're tasty little um, delicacies for other organisms so reptiles often will hide their eggs you know bury them on, in the sand or um, you know in the woods under leaves and they are um, well hidden to prevent for the most part to prevent predation so reptiles still have ectothermy so that means their body temperature is the same as the environment and because a lot of reptiles live in warm environments for them to survive, if someone buys a pet reptile, like a lizard that they see at the pet store, they're going to need a lot of support with heat lamps to make sure that they don't um, get too cold because that's going to destroy enzymes required for metabolism and, and kill them. So it's important that they be kept warm as the environment that they were adapted to. The birds, um, uh, this is the first organism now we see moving up the evolutionary tree that has endothermy, which means it the organism can maintain their own body temperature independent of the outside air. And birds are suited to do that because of the benefit of feathers. The feathers act, act as an insulator and keeps that heat inside. So these are endothermic. The lungs are much more well developed in the birds compared to the reptiles and they have special features um, in the skeleton that allow flight so flight is a big uh, development of these um, organisms so we know that they can move into new habitats like living in trees and you know places that other organisms can't get because they can fly so the keel is the, a modification of the sternum and that's where the muscles for flight attach uh, they also have very good vision, so the eyes are well developed, and they have instinctual behavior that is unique to the species. For example, when we looked at the video in the finches lab, we saw that they had behavior of certain dances and calls that were unique to their species, and that was instinctual. It wasn't taught. It just they just knew to knew how to do that. So that's a, an advancement of the birds over the reptiles. But if you look at a bird's feet and um, look at what they look like when they're first born, they have some kind of reptilian characteristics. So we do know that the birds did evolve from reptiles. So here's a little bit of bird anatomy. Here's that keel. That's where the, the flight muscles attach. That's what we uh, know about larger birds like the eagle that has plower, powerful uh, muscles for flying and can you know soar long distances and they have you know that well-developed keel for those muscles to attach and again the feathers provide warmth for uh, and maintaining that endothermy so most birds can fly but not all we know that penguins and ostriches cannot fly they're more adapted for living on land nonetheless they do have um, wings but they're uh, like the penguins, theirs are developed for swimming, and the ostriches are pretty much there for balance because the ostriches are very fast runners but um, cannot fly. So when we look at birds and how they're classified, we look at their f shape of their foot and where they live and their behavior and the shape of their beak. We know we looked at that with our finches on the Galapagos in that video. So um, birds are classified on a number of different characteristics some different bird beaks that are kind of unique in, in how they navigate their habitat. And lastly, the mammals. So the mammals include humans. And this is our group. This is where we belong. So class mammalia. The characteristics of organisms that are mammals is having hair. So not feathers, not scales, but actual hair. That's the characteristics of, of mammals. And they produce milk in mammary glands. So these organisms um, most, I shouldn't say all, but most do not lay eggs. 
Uh, there's a couple of there's an, ex, uh, an exception to that rule, which we'll talk about. But um, they nurse their young. That's what makes something a mammal. Uh, they have a well-developed skeleton with a skull and different different sized teeth, like molars and canines, premolars, incisors, um, that are sometimes developed for um, different prey, for example, or, or food. For example, the rabbit has well-developed incisors, while the you know the lion and the cougar and the cheetah all have well-developed canines. So it just depends on what their food source is. Um, internal organs, we already looked at the double loop circulatory pathway and that four chambered heart. So two atria, two ventricles, allowing for true separation of oxygenated and unoxygenated blood. So the, the tissues are getting freshly, highly oxygenated blood with the help of being oxygenated by the lungs. <coughs> they have well advanced kidneys to uh, conserve water and um, create urine or more urine if there's lots of water in the body or less urine if the animal is dehydrated. It just kind of maintains that water balance and a highly developed brain. And most of most mammals, their young develop inside the body. So they're not laid as eggs in the environment, but those young are developed inside the body and are born alive. So some examples of um, a mammal that still lays eggs, that's the duck-billed platypus. So that belongs to a special group of mammals called the monotremes. So they have an opening. They don't have um, a urethra and an anus. They have a common opening, which is called a cloaca. And they, again, like I said, they lay eggs. So that's a unique um, feature. But they do have mammary glands, so they do nurse their young. Marsupials include the kangaroo, and they are um, they contain a pouch for their young to develop in. So that's something that's kind of unique, having a pouch. So the young are very, very, very small and unable to survive in the environment. So they finish their development inside this pouch. And then the placental mammals are all the mammals that we're aware of in terms of like dogs and cats and um, us. We have um, internal development and the, um, the, the fetus receives its energy and nutrition through a placenta, which is an organ for exchange between the mother and the fetus. But again, these organisms uh, finish the development of their, well, the, in, in the monotremes, the development occurs ex exclusively in the egg. In the marsupials, uh, the development is finished in the pouch, where in the Placental mammals' development is complete inside the body with the help of that placenta as the organ for exchange. So here's an example of the duck-billed platypus that lays eggs. And here's some examples of some other marsupials. We have the possum and the koala. Again, they have a pouch. So when you look at other placental mammals you might be familiar with, there's different orders, so we're looking at class, class mammalia, so I'll be going a little more specific orders within the class mammalia. So these are all mammals. So whales and dolphins, those are not fish, those are mammals because they give birth to live young and have mammary glands. Uh, we look at the deer, that's arteriodactyla, that includes deer and cows. Uh, Perissodactyla, that's the horses, rhinoceros, carni carnivora or carnivora. Those are dogs and cats, and so on and so on. So we're not going to go through all of those, but um, these are all the different orders of mammals. There's more of those yet. You can just kind of look at your favorite animal and see kind of where it is on the list. But again, these are the most evolutionarily advanced of all the kingdom animalia are the placental mammals. Those are the most developed. So that concludes our lecture discussion of the vertebrates and the chordates.